So back in the fall of 2013, my family and I were on vacation in Japan, and this and the rebellion story just so happened to be in theaters. And since our trip mostly involved exploring the countryside, we didn't spend too many days in the big cities and the cinemas. Thus, I only had one day to myself to go see one of these two films, and of course I ended up going with one of the most divisive anime films ever. Now, I absolutely don't regret my choice, as I do think that the Rebellion story plays much better in the actual cinemas rather than a Precure movie, and in spite of my initial reactions to it, I have really warmed up to this movie to the point that I even bought a Blu-ray of it. That said, I can't help but ponder the road less traveled. This film did do a few things different than others in its franchise that I think would have made for a more interesting experience if I had gone to see it in the cinema. Granted, I still would have needed to gut my way through a very painful Miracle Light scene. Yeah, don't worry, we'll talk about that. Still, the going against the grain actually made for a good film. Well, let's take a look at Doki Doki Precure, the dress of hope that connects to the future. <laughs> We opened, of course, with a tutorial of the Miracle Lights. Yeah, I just want to save most of my Miracle Light criticisms for later, so I won't say much here. I will give them this, at least they're saving the movie budget on what's important, because this is one of the shortest and cheapest looking intros I've ever seen. <laughs> the movie proper opened with Ma's mother having found her old wedding dress. The same dress that her mother wore, and now the granddar wanted to use on her big day. Pretty sure she has more than one, Mr. Ida. Of course, Mana had no immediate plans, and just like the romanticism of wearing a wedding dress that had been passed down through three generations, her grandfather concurred saying that his late wife would more than likely have approved as well. We then got the opening, which like many other Precure films, was a special take on the series opening. Again, I really like it when they repurpose these animations like walking down the aisle and wait, we're suddenly at Mana's wedding? And the groom is... whoa. QUICK! SOMEBODY HAD ALL THE SHARP OBJECTS FROM RIKA! Nah, obviously, this is just a cheap dream sequence to open the movie, ending with an epic rotating shot of the Jiko Chu circling the Precure. Well, that's what happens when you fall asleep while watching an endless loop of the Grand Lagon openings. Yes, I've done that. You got a problem. At school, Mana informed her future waifus about the wedding dress, and this caught the ears of a couple of boys. <laughs> Dudes, don't mess with the mana harem if you value your lives. They later continued their conversation at Alice's tea party. Eventually, it led them into talking about a plot point, I mean, a time when mana helped an abandoned dog, yeah. She had taken the dog in and named it Mallow, but unfortunately lost him in an accident. Again, totally not blatant foreshadowing for what's to come. Would I lie? Back onto the subject of marriages, Alice ended up talking about the main proposal she had gotten for arranged marriages. Uh, worth mentioning that there's actually a bit of a subtitle error here, as she actually said 65, not 85. Doesn't really change the creep factor, I just want to say that before I go get my barf bag. Moving on from all of that, we cut over to an old movie theater that was being torn down with some of the locals taking notice and lamenting the cruelty of Father Time. And the next day, a certain hipster D-bag would stop by and say that he was going to stop the flow of time. Actually, I'm not even that far off as later a mysterious man stopped by and played his magical clarinet to bring the old projectors to life. From there, he also decided to recreate the climax of the Brave Little Toaster by bringing an entire junkyard to life. Eventually, every underused item in the city was brought together and formed into something out of a Ghibli movie. Mana managed to save the wedding dress by promising to wear it, but there was still the issue of the flying whale ship outside her house. The mysterious man named Mars seemed to have a special interest in her, though Mana didn't recognize him and his fabulous mutton chops. 
Thus, he moved into phase 2 of his plans, which involved using a bunch of projectors to trap everyone in films of their memories. You and a certain camera would yell on just fine. Actually, legit theory here, was this guy responsible for the creation of Meaden? He managed to get Ma's folks and almost the pre-cure too, but were saved at the last minute by the only butler who can make driving a pink car look awesome. Elsewhere, Alfred laments over the fact that his last significant theatrical role was in Justice League. They transformed to Engage Marsh, who considering his name kind of sounds like a certain shield kohais, he decided to summon a bunch of FGO looking minions, one of whom reminds me a little too much of one of my least favorite enemy types ever. Those crit buffs are ridiculous. Though Marsh decided that wasn't broken enough and provided them with infinite guts. And that covers all my FGO references. For the week. They of course tried to take out Marsh with their finishers, but since this is only the first act of the movie, naturally they weren't going to work. And after a furry version of the Macross Barrage, he KO'd them. However, our heroines weren't defeated, and with the help of Sebastian, they were going to make a swift retreat. Yeah, with this guy by their side, they have nothing to defeat- Uh oh. Well- we're boned! Sure enough, Marsh managed to literally catch them on film too. With that, each of the Precure woke up in worlds based on their old memories. Mom? Is that you? You're there now. Just relax. Horrible nightmare. Dream that I went back in time. Well, you're safe and sound now, back in good old 1955. 1955. Mana returned to the days when she was still in primary school, and her grandmother and Mallow were still alive. However, she herself still had her current memories, and thus tried to find clues to get back to the real world. No, don't look at that notebook, or else you might end up like Hana and get sent back to the womb! My dads are in a new Kojima game. Meanwhile, the fairy partners who had avoided capture were left to figure out their next course of action. However, they wouldn't have to do it alone as a new fairy arrived. <laughs> then again, she does kind of sound like the final boss of a different series. Bebel here provided the big exposition dump of the movie, explaining Marsh's plans to basically pull a cryosu long before they were ever a thing by trapping everyone in their idealized worlds of the past. Again, as if this guy didn't already look like Georgie Boy in his fancy suit. But yeah, in order to save everyone, they first had to bust the precure out. Before anything else though, Davy, understandably, wanted to know why Bebel knew all of this aside from just plot convenience. To which Bebel just said she and Mr. Mutton Chops were old friends. Well, you two are a couple of legendaries who aren't in Sword and Shield. You know, I think I just figured out this guy's motivation. Back with Mana, she was still looking for clues to escape this little dream world and thus tried consulting Rika only to find this literal John Smith instead. Oh no, the thought of losing your first waifu is turning her into a witch. The influence of the devil is spraying from the next year to over! Alice was also nowhere to be found, likely as a means to prevent Mana from escaping and force her to just accept living in this world of the past where two of her most significant loved ones were still alive. <laughs> Remember this line. The fairies used a rather clever tactic luring Marsh near the Clover Tower by making it look like there were still humans around. From there, it was just a matter of infiltrating his ship. <laughs> just as a reminder, this lady is the cat fairy. I think the only reason she didn't make the top 50 side characters was because the judges knew she was too OP. They managed to find a film room containing everyone's memories, which were conveniently labeled, making it easy for the fairies to find their partners. Well, at least the dude's an organized villain. However, as we saw earlier, Marsh had taken Mana's film off the shelf for his personal viewing pleasure. Thus, he managed to force the fairies to surrender, and yeah, that doesn't look at all suggestive. Anyway, just to prove a point, he showed the fairies the precure enjoying being trapped in the worlds of their memories. Of course, the fairies, especially Bebel, didn't agree with the proto-George, and thanks to a little mass shifting by Davy, they managed to escape their binds and jumped into the precure films. Thank you, last action hero. Charles entered Mana's film, which was reaching its very tragic climax. And it all started when her grandmother had been hospitalized due to a minor accident. 
Now, the tragic part wasn't her grandmother passing, that would come later, but the much bigger heartbreak would take place after she got home. For as it turned out, while she was rushing to go see her grandmother, Mana ended up exciting Mallow to the point that he managed to free himself from his leash and tried to follow his owner. And unfortunately, he never did catch up to her. So, yeah, there's a dead animal in this movie. Go freak here. I mean, to be fair, we're certainly not breaking any new ground here, Disney has done it for years, and let's not forget about that one fairy tale that got brought up a lot in this series. All that said, and the fact that Death is no stranger to this franchise, they hammer it in pretty hard in this scene. I mean, not only do they have a young Mana blaming herself, not only do they have Marsh rub it in her face, but they even throw in an insert song sung by the Precure with lyrics that are basically talking about the five stages of grief. <sighs> this isn't the movie trying to hit the viewers with the feels, oh no. This is the movie trying to bludge them to death with it. And call me a sadist, but I actually think I would have liked to have seen the reaction this would have gotten in the cinemas. I mean, the acceptance of death is never an easy hurdle to overcome, regardless of age. So for me, this could have been a very powerful scene, which I would have liked to have seen the reaction to. Anyway, with the anime version of Volt Yeller having reached its conclusion, Marsh, like many pretentious filmmakers these days, declared himself the winner. However, his most harsh critic in Bebel didn't agree, saying that Mana would always find a way to get back up. Marsh's response to this was just to have his guys take care of the other Precure. Because yeah, forget all that talk about giving everyone their idealized worlds. In the case of Alice and Rika, what they wanted was to go back to the days when their parents weren't as busy as they are now and could spend more time with them. However, in both cases, the girls felt like there was something missing. A certain someone in their lives. Thus, with such similar plot lines in their films, the Rika and Alice movies crossed over. Because of course Toy would try to connect every movie in spite of contradicting continuities. A nice touch here that I really love is how the aforementioned insert song called Treasure was still playing, and while its initial lyrics were very depressing to match up with Mana losing her dog, by this point they took a more triumphant turn as Rika and Alice start to wake up from their fantasies, with their fairy friends providing the final push in the most traditional of Precure ways. However, they didn't have much time to exchange pleasantries as the baddies had arrived to deal with them. Elsewhere, Makoto's idealized world was, of course, a Trump kingdom that had yet to be taken over by King Selfishness. Davy managed to wake her up, and oh good gravy! Uh, okay, I don't think I would have wanted to be in the cinemas for this scene at least. I'm pretty sure most kids and adults would have had the exact same reactions. Anyway, as many of us knew at this point, Makoto never did stop blaming herself for being unable to protect her kingdom. So, of course she would want to run away to a fantasy land, even though a part of her knew it wasn't real. However, thanks to her fairy partner reminding her of the promise she made with her friends, Makoto managed to snap out of it. And just in time to deal with the mannequin lady, who was nowhere near as intimidating as her non-animated brethren. She tried to compensate for this by using them to turn into... whatever this is. Don't do drugs, kids! Rika and Alice also had to deal with some bigger problems when their two enemies came together. <laughs> oh no, they turned him into a Michael Bay-style combiner. I swear, if they bring up anything involving his lower regions, I'm quitting. Using some well-animated teamwork, as well as some attacks that really should have been included in the main show, they managed to defeat Demolisher, though they were also totally drained by the end. Makoto wasn't having an easier time since she was fighting alone. Oh yeah, I kinda forgot about those two. I mean, they're only like, what, uh, 47 minutes into the movie and they're only now showing up? Together, they managed to quickly defeat the Super Automata, but just as quickly, she took them out with one last explosion. With all of her teammates down, it was up to Mana to bust herself out. This wasn't going to be an easy task because, let's face it, after seeing her dog die and knowing that her grandmother would soon follow, it's hard to blame Mana for not wanting to leave this world. Even her fairy partner wasn't able to snap her out of it. No, much like another pink cure whose name is literally spelled with love, it took the words of a grandparent to snap her out. 
Yeah, in spite of everyone else seeming to be a sort of NPC in this world, Mana's grandmother seemed to maintain full sentience. I do believe there's a reason for this, but I think I'll save that, as well as the review of who this lady's VA is for later. For now, not only did Hologram Granny help Mana hear the voices of her friends, but also convince her to go in spite of Mana saying that they would never be able to meet again. I think the Hologram likely knew full well that her time in the real world had already expired, and just like a real grandparent, wanted their grandchild to keep moving forward with their love and memories intact. Again, this is really powerful stuff as they're basically talking about mortality and the acceptance of death here. Just try and process that. After reteaching her a charm she used earlier in the movie, as well as the first episode of the series, Mana managed to break free of Marsh's film world along with all of her teammates. Again, don't know how exactly Agri managed to enter Makoto's film world, though I do have some theories that I'll talk about later. Anyway, like any good movie villain, Marsh had a transformation into what looked like a werewolf at first, but... <laughs> Yep, we got a Silent 2 twist ending here, folks. Actually, the real twist is even more ridiculous, but we'll get to that in just a minute. For now, all of the Precure defended against Marsh's attacks, with the exception of Mana. Okay, is this movie actually being directed by Michael Bay? Because that felt like a rather pointless explosion. Oh well, I think we all still know what to expect from a movie like this. Like Mana here, trying to calm Marsh down while some... Ketchup flows down her shoulder? Wait, where did she get all that ketchup from? Eh? That's not ketchup? Then what is it? Oh, blood. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Wait, what? Yep, this is by far the scene that most fans remember from this film. Mana, the lead precure, bleeding rather heavily. I mean, it's not just a scratch. A scratch? No, it isn't. It's a full-on gas with blood streaming down her arm. Now, would I say I think this is the most shocking thing I've ever seen in the Precure franchise? Absolutely not. I'd be more shocked at stuff like Setsuna's backstory, the mask, and in general, I think I've seen the Precure take much more brutal, bloodless beatings. All that said, this is the first and only time so far in the entire franchise, not counting the manga, where we've seen a significant amount of the Crimson. So, naturally, it is going to punctuate any scene it's in. The fact that they haven't done this again might mean that they caught cold feet after the first time, but hey, at least it also means they're not overusing it, and the next time they do use it, it'll be all the more special. Mana purposely took the bite in order to fully embrace Marsh's feelings. After all, what kind of dog owner can't withstand at least a few bites from their pet? Some kind of mysterious voice did try to convince Marsh not to listen to her as she had clearly moved on from him after his death. However, just because we move on, that doesn't mean we necessarily forget about those of the past and won't still feel the pain of loss. With that, Marsh, or rather, Mallow, was able to break free of the evil force that was controlling him. Said evil force, by the way, was, uh... Oh no, Squidward's resentment towards Spongebob has been transferred to his clarinet! Yeah, that's the best sense I can recall of all of this. I'll admit, starting from here, the third act does kind of lose me. Like seriously, with no explanation or any sort of backstory, they turned the clarinet into the big bad of this movie. I just love the fact that this thing doesn't even have a proper entry on the Precure wiki because it's such an out of nowhere villain. With that, the evil clarinet, yeah we never did get a proper name for this stupid thing, took his ship and claimed that he was warping to the Precure's future to destroy it. What exactly would that accomplish? Seriously, what is it with Toyin just not getting time travel? I mean, if this were the case, Cryos would have won before Hakuto even started. Speaking of which, since they didn't have any time-traveling god babies, they needed an alternative to get to the future. Agri suggested that they use the miracle lights that I was just able to manifest out of nowhere. And if the deus ex machina-ness of just these few minutes weren't enough... You're not actually Agri, are you? You're just Kagura using your Gintama fourth wall-breaking abilities. 
Yes, unfortunately, this movie did the hairy fourth wall break several years before All-Star's memories. I just really can't stand it when characters talk directly to the audience as it completely breaks immersion. Thus, as much as I hate to say it, even New Stage 2 handled this better. At least there, you could argue Tart was just talking to the fairy students, and in this scene, they could've just have had Augury talk to her teammates, but nope, once you acknowledge the existence of the people in the theater, there ain't no turning back. I'll personally buy all of you lifetime passes on the Denliner, just never do a scene like this ever again, please. So they made the jump to the future, and landed in front of a church, and Mana's wedding. Of course, Squidward's clarinet soon appeared in his... King Jellyfish ship. Okay, forget the blood. That thing alone should get this movie an R rating. So they engaged the giant jellyfish with a surprisingly decent mixture of 2D and 3D animation. I mean, at least they have fairly expressive faces here. Only minor complaint I have about this sequence is. <laughs> At the center of the ship, they found the clarinet and attempted to take it out with the lovely straight flush, but understandably, it didn't want to job out to that stupid attack. During its counterattack, Malo took a hit for Mana. Dogs do not catch breaks in toy films, do they? His sacrifice gave Mana a new super mode, which, while I do like the design better than the Parthonian mode, it's kind of pointless as it only lasts for a few seconds, just long enough to one-shot the evil clarinet. Did I mention this movie has kind of gone off the rails? Oh well, at least the wrap-up is decent, as after a flashback where we learned the aforementioned origins of Mana's name, we got one last, really touching twist. <laughs> Yep, the little fairy was Mana's grandmother, Isuzu, likely explained why the film granny had sentience because the real thing was nearby. Thus, the film ended with her and Malo ascending back up into heaven, saying that they would continue to watch over Mana. In spite of some story hiccups, especially during that third act, I still consider this to be one of the strongest Precure solo films, thanks to having some fantastic characters, legit shocking moments, and unlike the last film I reviewed, a well-told and fantastic moral that I think all of us should absorb. First, let's take a look at the movie characters who weren't just inanimate objects given unexplained origins. Malo is definitely one of the most tragic Precure villains ever, mostly because what happened to him could and has happened to many pets in real life. No external forces of evil or the like broke his leash, it was just an unfortunate accident where no one was really at fault, but everyone still blamed themselves. In the end, tragedies like Malo's are all a part of life and we can't change that. Marsh tried to go against this notion by entrapping everyone in the happiest moments of their lives where sorrow and death can't exist. But, I think Rick put it best. The people that spend their life avoiding death are already dead. Yes, Precure actually went and said, sometimes we just have to gut through the difficult times. Now obviously, they didn't go for the full Rick Sanchez nihilistic viewpoint, but did acknowledge there are difficult times. This viewpoint came from Bebel, aka Suzu, who had lived a full life and therefore knew that while there will always be difficult times, there may also be just as many joyous moments weighing in the unknown future. More importantly, we all have a duty to share that joy and love with others so that it can be continued to be passed down onto others in future generations. It's a fantastic message that was given enough gravitas that could be appreciated by all viewers. Now of course, all that said, that doesn't totally excuse the issues with the third act of this film. Agri just comes out of nowhere and has a not as cringy, but still pretty bad All-Stars Memories Miracle Light scene. And I'm not even sure if Doc Brown could properly explain what the evil clarinet's time-traveling plan was. Also, I must repeat this, evil clarinet. What was wrong with just having the dog be the villain throughout? Maybe they could've pulled a Kami and Piccolo and just have him separated to Marsh and Mallow and have the final fight be with the former and the latter sacrifices himself to stop his evil half. Yes, that sort of plot point is also a little out of nowhere, but it wouldn't be as bad as this. This stupid thing could even stop Engage Mode's final attack because it didn't have arms. 
While I still ultimately really like this movie, that third act is the red dot on the white rain dress of this movie. Regardless, for delivering a powerful message, giving us some of the first bits of crimson in this entire franchise, and for letting us enjoy at least a few last good moments with these great characters, I do highly recommend checking out this film, perhaps with your own pets by your side. Next up on the docket is probably one of the most controversial Precure series ever. I'll try to get to it by the end of the year, but I also might do some videos in between, so we'll see. And until then though, fair enough for now my friends, and... I have to buy Denlier passes for everyone. I hope they provide holiday discounts.